Good afternoon. It's just about uh, 12 Eastern Standard Time, about time to get us started with the microservice development in Azure using containers and Kubernetes. My name is Jean-François Biodeau, or JF, whatever works best for you. So to give you an overview as to what I'm hoping to do uh, with you guys, we're going to break it into more or less four parts. The first three parts are going to be the presentation itself, the slides, uh, where we'll talk about what are microservices? Right? I find, unfortunately, uh, even though in the industry, microservices have been around for a good 10 years, they're well, they're well established, well understood, there's still a lot of misunderstanding as to what microservices really are. Uh, and I find uh, that we can go in one of two directions as well. And I'm hoping that by the end of the session, we'll have a better idea as to what's what, uh, whether something is truly a microservice or if it's a macro service or if it's a nano service going down too small uh, when it comes to services so talk about those micro services move into containers and use containers to help us build those micro services and then we're going to get to a tour a tour of docker kubernetes and grant um, and demonstrate that practically with you guys so let me uh, turn off the webcam for now um, and uh, carry along with the presentation. So I'm going to begin with a definition right up from microservices.io. What are microservices, also known as the microservices architecture, is an architectural style that structures an application as a collection of services. And now there's four, uh, five important characteristics for us over here. Um, the five important characteristics over here are that they be highly maintainable and testable all right that's essential for a microservices architecture over here um what we mean by that is highly maintainable if there's one thing that i've observed in my career is that the easy part when it comes to writing code is actually writing the code itself the difficult part is a getting the code to work correctly and b maintaining the code all right very often the code that we write today will need to maintain for years to come so i want to make sure that the code that we write is as maintainable as possible there's a number of practices that we can use to achieve that but those practices become a core characteristic of microservices development and we can talk about uh, how microservices assist with that as well another hugely important aspect is that they be highly testable and i do agree with that 100 percent um whether well i would recommend as much as possible use the full, full gamut of testing over here going from uh unit to integration to system to uat and whatever you want to use along the way uh, to make sure that your services are tested through and through and continuously because they're smaller it should be much easier to set up tests for those Another important characteristic is loosely coupled. Uh, service A and service B should be as independent of one another. Now uh, that uh, ties into the next one over here, very important, independently deployable. All right. In other words, I should not have to wait for service B to be updated, deployed before I deployed service A. I should not have to get into complex orchestration when it comes to updating my services. Now, the next one is or the next two, actually, I think are hugely important as well, but very quickly forgotten. Now, if you're a programmer yourself, uh, when we talk about things like highly maintainable, testable, loosely coupled, independently deployable, uh, these are probably things you're thinking of. Yeah, well, we try to do that for any application that we write. But the next two over here deals more from a organizational perspective. First of all, organized around business capability what does that mean well i'll give you a practical example very soon but it needs to be built for the business not for the servers or the database or the uh whatever else we have in the back end but for the business i'll come back to that and finally and i think this one is also hugely important owned by a small team it's owned by the team it is not something that goes uh, that gets bounced around from team to team to team. Uh, and here's another anti-pattern I would recommend we steer clear of when it comes to microservices development is the idea of having a development team and a 
maintenance team. I, I do that. I see that with a lot of organizations, especially large organizations, where they have two teams, a team to write the code and a team to maintain the code. Forget that. Get rid of that. Both teams become one and they own that service, right? Um, so there's no difference between maintaining the code, no matter how you define maintenance, versus evolving, developing new code, new capabilities for your application. It is a team effort at this point. So these are five essential characteristics of microservices. Now, one of the things that you'll notice we don't put over here is we don't talk about size. How big is a microservice or how small should a microservice be? Well, it's one of those things that's a little bit harder to define over here, we're not going to talk about lines of code. Lines of code are useless in really measuring the size of a service. It depends on too many factors. How long does it take you to develop the service? That might be maybe a better metric over here. I've once uh, heard that uh, a microservice is something uh, that if you were to lose the code of, you should be able to redevelop in about two weeks. Not a bad metric, but again, it's hard to define over here, especially since we're not going to develop and redevelop and re-redevelop those uh, services. We're going to evolve them over time. So how do we measure the size of a microservice? Well, a couple of additional things I'd like to suggest for you over here is ensure that your services have clear, defined focus, goals, or concern that they're responsible for. Right? Uh, and ensure that the concerns are singular, not plural. Right? A service should be there to deal with one facet of the business. One, uh, you could even think of it as one set, uh, one process in the business. And that's usually my uh, the approach that I use over here is organize microservices around either business process or a part of those business process activities within those business process. So strong suggestion for you, uh, organize your microservices as, um, as a, a component that either handles a business process, for example, expenses, or um, I'll give you some examples of that as we carry along. I want to give you some, uh, uh, discuss those as we carry along, versus <laughs> or, or if the, the, the process is too broad, maybe break it into a set of services that participate in an activity in that process, whatever that process may be. So a couple of suggestions, or um, let's discuss an example over here. <laughs> and I'll start actually with a, a anti-example of a microservice. Let me switch over to a bit of a whiteboard over here. Uh, and let's use the following scenario. Um, let's say we're developing something I think we can all understand, some kind of HR system, human resource system over here. Uh, and when it comes to managing HR, well, what do we manage? Well, some people might say, well, Jeff, we need to manage things like employees, we need to manage uh, positions, uh, we need to manage, um, um, I don't know uh, what else over here, salary. But that's not the right start, the right mentality over here. Why? Well, as I said earlier, we want to focus our microservices around business process. Employees, position, salary, those are not processes. They're entities that participate in those processes, object if you'd like, but they're not processes. So let me change that around uh, a little bit. So what is involved when it comes to employees? Well, uh, we have, and actually let me begin with that to show you why it's not the right place to start uh, and uh, also introduce you to, uh, unfortunately, a very common anti-pattern I see when it comes to microservices development. Let's say over here we decide uh, with that mentality. We'll begin with the elephant over here, the employees, all right? What do we need to manage about our employee? Well, let's say over here we decide, hey, let's build a service over here, and I'll represent it as a box with a uh, with an interface over here, uh, and that interface is going to expose some operation. Operation like, well, what do we need to do? Well, uh, for reportings and the like, I might need to be able to get an employee, let's say by ID. Uh, I might need to get a list of employee. 
especially if it's a small organization. Uh, but of course, I'll need to update those employees. I'll need to be able to insert an employee. Uh, I'll need to be able to, of course, update employee um and of course let's wrap things up what do we need to do well we need to delete uh employees over here so what did i propose over here for my quote-unquote microservice well if you take a look at this uh, some of you might be familiar with the acronym if i were to describe this as a crud interface most of you probably recognize that this stands for create re update Delete, right? The type of operation you do against a database. And that implies as well that this uh, service um, it would be ideal over here to expose the employees in my database. Uh, and of course, we're going to slap in front of that some kind of a presentation, a UI of some kind that the user can, uh, can use to consume that employee service. So at first glance, while well, you can replace the word employee with just about any business entity you can think of, and it looks like a very, or some of us, it may look like a very sound, simple, sensible way of developing your application. But as I'm saying earlier, as I said earlier, this is actually a bit of an anti-pattern when it comes to developing microservices. Why is that? Well, here's a couple of things I'd like you to consider when it comes to those services over here, right? Um, I said we want to create a get employee by ID. Why do we need a get employee by ID? Well, I said probably for some reports. So why am I suggesting that? Well, this is a hypothetical API, not practical. The difference over here is I think there might be a need for that API, but I haven't found a practical distinct need for that API. So I'm building API over here, not based on what the business will need it for, but based on what I think the business might need it for. Now, I know that when we do things like um, well, our design work, our business analysis work, that sort of thing, we do have to make sure we understand requirements and we have to elicit those requirements. So some discovery needs to take place, but we're talking about business requirements. Here, I skipped over that, and I went directly into the design of the application, the specifications, if you like. So I skipped over a step altogether, a crucial step. Uh, but that's not the biggest uh, biggest flaw, the biggest sin that we have over here when it comes to that uh, design over here. We said that microservices needs to be loosely coupled, highly maintainable, highly testable. Is that highly maintainable, highly testable? Well, again, at first glance, you might say, well, yeah, JF, I mean, if I use things like JPA, the Java world, the entity framework, or whatever ORM object relational mapping you want to use over here, it would be trivial to implement, right? Couple of lines of code, boom, you've got the service done. Easy enough. But is that really what's going to happen? I know, let's talk about the get employee by ID. Can everybody invoke that, uh, that API? Or only some roles use that API. I may need to put some uh, some uh, authorization logic, hopefully declarative authorization logic in place. But then you might have two different roles that can pull up employee by ID. One role might be from HR themselves who need to be able to pull up their, uh, say, their salary so that we can pay those employees. Others might be from other roles in the organization where they just need to be able to pull up, let's say, employee names and maybe their uh, the position that they occupy right now within the business. So the problem over here is depending on which role it is, I need to return two different structure for my employee, which implies a couple of things over here. A, in terms of business logic, it's no longer just, a, okay, let's open a connection to database, let's send a select statement, receive it, map it to an object, send back the object. Now I have to introduce at least one if in here. And then how do I return one of two different structure? All right, one that may include, let's say, salary information and uh, say their uh, home phone number, home address, that sort of thing, and another one that doesn't. Do I null out all of those fields? 
or do I send back a different object, a different class, if you prefer, that would be structured differently? Ooh, starting to be messy. And of course, writing the client for that gets messy as well. The documentation gets messy as well, because now you have to explain, well, if it's this role, you can expect to receive that. If it's that role, then you can expect to receive this. So in terms of, again, testability, that means the tests are becoming more complex. In terms of maintainability, code becomes more complex. Uh, in terms of uh, quality of the code, well, it's going to degrade over time. It's going to get much more complex. Another good example of that would be the update employee, which again, at first seems so trivial, right? Uh, you use something like JPA, one or two lines of code, boom, you've written your update employee. But then, what kind of update did they do? Did they just change their legal name? All right, somebody got married, they changed their last name. Does that impact any other systems out there? What if they move from one place to another? All right, their home address changes. So do we need to, does that impact any of the logic? What if they got a pay raise, they a change in position? when it comes to that, right? So these are different scenarios to consider. And uh, depending on what was changed, for example, if it's a legal name, well, uh, there might be a couple of systems that needs to be updated, might not be that uh, big of a deal, but I doubt it's overly trivial either. What if it's a change of address? All right, what if they move, for example, I'm in a, I'm in a Get Snow right now. What if they move from Ottawa to Get Snow? That changes their uh, province. That changes some of their tax information. We may need to notify other systems of that. What if they got a pay raise? Right? Can anybody issue an update employee to increase or change the salary of any other employees out there? So again, different roles will use that service differently. So again, for the programmers and the analysis in the classroom, I'm hoping that uh, you're starting to get this really messy UML diagram in your mind or BPMN diagram as to how, uh, how we need to implement uh, update employee. So depending on what the user ultimately, uh, what changes have been done and by who, this would determine what actually happens behind the scene. It gets massively complex. But this is not even the biggest sin, in my opinion, when it comes to that design. Here's where we fail in terms of microservices development. When we develop a microservice, let me just go back over here because I want to highlight for you guys that when we design a microservice, we design it around business capability. All right, does that look like business capability? Things like insert an employee. What kind of business capability is that? Do, does a company insert employees? Do companies update employees? Do companies, ooh, goodness forbid, do they delete employees? Do you see a little bit where I'm going with this one? Those are not business operation. Those are database operation. So what the problem with this design over here is I did not design a business oriented service. I designed a system or even a database centric service over here. The perspective of my application is wrong. And this is the biggest sin over here in my opinion when it comes to the design of that application is that I designed the application from the database out. This is not the direction that we want to take. We want to design the application from the user in. I'm hoping that we can all agree that the vast majority of the code that we write is written to service users, be them internal or external users. It doesn't really matter, all right? So that's really the biggest sin in terms of that design over here. So how would I redesign that service, right? Now, we could spend a couple of days on that, so I'll keep it as short as possible over here, fairly short for us over here. How would I design it? Well, let's forget about doing it from an entity basis. We don't, uh, yes, we have business entity that we need to manage, but when we write code, we write code not for, well, we do write them for business entity, but we write them to support operations on those entities, or if you prefer, 
business processes or activities as i mentioned previously so very important over here start with what is it that the business needs to be able to do so for example a business does not insert employees I'm not even sure what the heck that means and i'm not i think i prefer not knowing ultimately uh, what do we do well we hire employees that's a process could be simple, could be very complex, depending on the organization that, could, that you come from. Um, it could be uh, hiring, could be implemented as maybe one uh, service, or there's a good chance that it would be a combination of services. Things like um, defining what openings that we have, uh, sending out maybe advertisement, posting over uh, out there uh, on the web, wherever we're going to put them, start receiving resumes, identify the candidate, provide mechanism to manage those candidates, uh, and of course, get uh, set up with uh, interviews and uh, go through a selection process. Again, it could be very formal or informal, depending on the business that you come from, the organization that you work with, but that is one or more business process. So I would structure a one or more service around a hiring process. So maybe a process to deal with, um, to deal with openings that I want to advertise, a process to deal with candidatures that we receive, maybe online, maybe through the, well, through the mail. I don't think that happens too much today, but um, a process for that. Process to deal with interviews, for example. Uh, processes to help with the selection of our candidate. Processes to deal with the onboarding of that candidate. So these are business processes. They have nothing to do with the database. Uh, and speaking of database, let me wind it down with that. Uh, food for thought. When it comes to databases, we're talking about uh, microservices, and of course, uh, databases are present in microservices architecture, but food for thought, because we now have microservices, microprocesses, little application that do uh, a couple of operations, but do them really well, and they're really focused on what they do over here. Generally, behind the scene, let's do the same with our database have micro databases right just like we have microservices we have micro database what does that mean well it does imply a couple of changes over here but it implies that now instead of having big fat monolithic databases uh, um, as most of us are probably well familiar with let's move towards micro databases databases that are owned by one and exactly one service no more all right um this will greatly accelerate the agility of your database the ability to evolve your database over time so consider um, the, the same criteria that we apply to our code over here let's also start applying them to our database now i'm going to wrap up that quick uh, this discussion over here with one more point um we're talking about microservices uh, architecture. I do believe there's tremendous value behind microservices architecture. One of the things though that I believe is even more important is the, um, is the idea of if it ain't broke, don't fix it. In the sense that if we already have, let's say an HR system at works and it's not Phoenix, for my Canadian uh, participants today. If you're familiar with the Phoenix Pay system, you know what I'm talking about. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the Phoenix Pay system, it's a case study in what not to do when it comes to replacing a big, massive pay system with another one. Unfortunately, that's something where we wasted billions of our taxpayers' money uh, in Canada over. But moving ahead when it comes to that, what I'm getting at over here is I don't recommend you decide, okay, let's flush our existing HR system and let's rewrite the whole thing from the ground up as a microservice architecture. Evolve it towards a microservice architecture. It's not a, a big bang approach, generally don't work for that. But I'll leave it as that. So we've talked about, in a nutshell, what a microservices architecture. Again, I wish I could spend more time on that, but I'll leave it as that. Instead, let's move to one of the best technology, almost an essential technology when it comes to dealing with microservices, which is containerization. Your microservice, how do you write that? Well, you write them in 
pretty much any programming language you want to use, any stack you want to use. The distinction over here is we favor standalone executable. Whether they be written in Python or Java or .NET or Node or whatever you want, it's okay, but keep them as standalone application. In other words, let's avoid uh, application server like WebSphere, WebLogic, Tomcat, IIS, that sort of thing. Uh, let's run them as standalone application. All modern development frameworks have full support for that. Now, one of the things I'm sure we've all encountered, especially for the programmers in the session today, um, I, I could almost say show of hands, how many of you have ever encountered that? You write a piece of code, you test the heck out of it on your machine, it works gloriously well. It is bulletproof on your machine. You bring it to another machine, nothing works. I, I think that this is probably something we've all encountered at one point or another. Now, the reason why I'm mentioning that over here is um, with containerization, one, the prime goal of containerization is actually to avoid that issue. Where when, we, when it comes to moving an application from one machine to another, one environment to another, let's avoid issues where it works on one machine, doesn't work on another machine, we have to troubleshoot uh, why. Uh, let's avoid that by uh, instead of just moving the executable code, we're going to move the entire environment in which the application runs. By environment, I'm talking about the disk. I'm talking about the runtime frameworks that are available in place. Uh, for example, if you're using Java, which version of Java are you running or which version of .NET or Python are you running over here? Does it really matter over here? Um, and uh, what about additional libraries you might be using over here? Let's make sure they're all packaged together in one neat little container. And when it comes to running the application, we just bring up the container, the, the container brings up the application for you. Uh, and that brings us to another advantage of containerization isolation, where now your application can be isolated from other application running on the same uh, on the same machine. In other words, application A doesn't see the files and folders that application B does. Application A cannot communicate directly with application B unless we use controlled channels of communication, right? So we control the environment of those applications. And the environment is fully portable from one machine to the next. I mean, it goes back to one of the description that we had for that video over here in the email that was sent out for you. We've talked about the idea of write once, run anywhere. And by anywhere, I'm talking about running it on my development machine, running it in my test lab, running it maybe on premise on my servers, but also I want to run it on my cloud environment in AWS and Azure and GCP, DigitalOcean, doesn't really matter which one we use. I'd like to be able to run my application anywhere with little to no change. Can we do that today? And the answer is yes, thanks to two technologies. The first one is Docker, right? Docker, which is a set of products that uses OS level virtualization to develop software and packages called containers. There's a number of reasons why Docker became the de facto when it comes to containerization. It's not the only technology, it's not even the oldest technology when it comes to containerization, but it's by far the most popular for a couple of good reasons. Uh, containers are isolated from one another and bundle their own files, libraries, and configuration files. So the cool part over here is as a programmer, as I'm writing code, I'm going to build the environment in which the application runs. All right, and by environment, I just specify, well, I'll need, let's say, this version of the .NET SDK, I need that version of the entity framework, and this version of whatever, uh, and package all of that over here and run it on my machine, debug it right from my machine over here, but run it in its own container. Once I've got something that looks good, I can check it in, push it through my um, a test lab, my test environment, hopefully fully automated test environment, and we don't rebuild the container, well, we might, but the idea over here is we have the same environment in test as I had in dev. All right, basically, I pushed the dev environment in test. 
And then once test, let's say, is greenlit, we want to push it into production. However, we're going to do that. Then we're going to push exactly that same environment once again in production. So again, the important part over here is the application is not just executable code. So it's not just a .exe or a .jar, .var, a couple of Python files, zip file containing uh, Node.js file, doesn't really matter what it is. It's everything that we need to run the environment as a container. Containers can communicate with each other through well-defined channel. I hinted at that and I'll show you how Docker handled that, at least at a very high level. And all containers are run by a single operating system kernel and therefore use fewer resources than your virtual machine. Now, for those of you who were thinking, well, JF, what you're describing over here sounds a lot like a VM, all right? I'm talking about machines that comes with their own file system. They're isolated from one another. Sorry, I shouldn't say machine, but uh, application. They come with their own file system. Everything they need to run is already on their file system. Uh, this is isolated from the actual host file system. They run in isolation from one another. So uh, service A does not see service B and vice versa. Uh, they can only use control communication channel, typically network sockets, uh, that sort of thing. Well, the reason is it is very close to virtualization. Now, for those of you who are familiar with virtualization, and also for those of us who may not be, uh, in virtualization, we normally have three elements. We have a host op operating system, Windows, Linux, it doesn't really matter. On top of that, we're going to have a, uh, actually, let me, uh, refine this over here. Uh, we're typically going to have a couple of guest operating system, on GOS guest operating system, and on top of that, we have really what it is the the reason why we have that VM in the first place, which is the application we want to run on that VM. Right. Uh, but what it, it implies over here, what the slide implies is that in virtualization, you have, in this case, I would have four operating system running on the same machine. All uh, It doesn't matter if it's the same one. It could all be Windows, could all be Linux. It doesn't really matter. I've got four instances of Windows or Linux running on the same machine. With virtualization, we can offload the need for duplication of the operating system because the application will run directly against the host operating system over here. Well, they, they, they are still isolated. We still use virtualization the same way that a VM, virtual machine, works. But the difference here is instead of virtualizing the entire machine, we virtualize the environment in which they run, which again implies things like their file system, the disk that they have access to. Each and every one of them have a isolated disk, but actually disks are even more efficient in uh, in um, containers than they are in VMs. So we could talk about that, but I'll leave that as is. So that's the last bullet that we see over here. So all containers are run by a single operating system kernel and therefore use fewer resources than virtual machine. Now, I said Docker is one of the two elements that we need to uh, implement uh, microservices. So what's the second one? Well, the challenge over here is writing a microservice reasonably easy. We've got wonderful technologies to help us with that today. The challenge, though, is managing those services. And that's where Kubernetes comes into play. It's an open source system for automating deployment, scaling, and management of containerized application. That's all it's about. It's there to help us manage dozens, hundreds, tens of thousands, millions of containers if necessary. And I'm not exaggerating when I'm talking about millions of containers. There are numerous organizations that can readily brag that they are managing tens of millions of containers 
through Kubernetes. So it groups containers that makes up an application into a logical unit for easy management and discovery. And we could spend a lot more time on this. I'll have to keep it very superficial over here. And Kubernetes builds upon 15 years of experience of product running production workload at Google. So it was actually born at Google, open source by Google, and it combines the best of breed idea and practices from the community. Now, something else I find is uh, important about Kubernetes is that it's not an academic project, nor was it a commercial project. It started as a solution that was built to address the complexity of managing millions of application containers that were running at Google. So that brings us to our demo. All right, uh, where I'd like to demonstrate writing application with Docker, Kubernetes, and of course, let's do that on Azure. Um, and if needs be, we could talk about how we could achieve the same in different environments. Uh, before I do that, uh, I see I've got a question over here. What are the differences between microservices and services we can find on an ESB uh, platform? Uh, the difference over here would be things like coupling uh, things like deployment, if we use ESB, um, which is, by the way, something we generally avoid in today's architecture, um, ESBs have become their own monolith. They include a lot of logic that is uh, scattered and sprinkled over here. It becomes very difficult to make changes to an ESB without affecting application or vice versa, changing an application without impacting ESB or other application in that pipeline, right? So ESBs over here are their own monolith. And by, when I'm talking about a monolith, one of the, the challenge we want to address over here is we want to be able to, um, to evolve our application quickly. We want to have agility, the ability to respond to change quickly and monolithic code bases, whether it's a database, an ESB uh, uh, or an application, a Java.NET, doesn't really matter what type of application. The more code there is, the more concerns there is spread through that code, the harder it is to make changes to it. All right. If you find yourself you're in a situation right now where if you are, uh, if you propose a change, for example, a change to a database, a change to an ESB, a change to a code base, and then developers start getting cold sweats down their back, thinking, ooh, I don't know, if we did start doing that change, how is that going to impact the rest of the system? We have to spend weeks, months, goodness forgive, uh, forbid, years trying to figure out what the impact would be. Then you have a technical debt in front of you. You'll want to consider migrating to microservices. Uh, moving ahead, uh, let me just take a look at uh, no messages in the chat. All right, so let's move ahead with the demonstration. Now, what I'm going to use for that demonstration over here is I'll use WSL. I'm running this on Windows right now, but WSL, which is Windows Services for Linux. In other words, I can run Linux on Windows outside of a virtual machine. Well, technically it is in Hyper-V, it is a virtual machine, but the important part over here is I'm going to do that through Linux. I'll be honest with you, I'm not trying to get into an OS war over here or uh, preference for OS, but realistically speaking, you want to get into containerization, run Linux, do it in Linux, all right? If you want to do, uh, do your development on Windows, that's cool. I'm going to do that right now, but do your development on Linux as I'm about to do over here, all right? I'm going to run everything else on Windows, but the, the reason is containerization was born and is optimized to run in a Linux environment. Same thing if you're doing this on Mac OS, you've got a Mac machine where yourself, I know Mac is a Unix machine, but it is not the same as Linux. Uh, Linux is mostly compatible with Unix. So the reality is if you wanna run uh, containers Docker on Mac, you can, but again, it would be done via, uh, via virtualization. The only way to run Docker natively is actually on Linux. So that's what I'm going to use over here by using WSL. This is only available for Windows 10. By the way, WSL is also a Microsoft product, um, so it's not a third-party thing. 
So let's move ahead. What I'm going to do, let me go into, let's say, a temp directory over here. Uh, and what I'll do over here is I'll check out a project. All right, I'm not the one who wrote that project, but I'll use that project over here to get us started with, uh, to get us started with, uh, uh, with that. Let me just find my link over here. There we go, all right? So I'll do a git clone over here, boom, and show you what the project looks like. It's a very simple project, it's a Python application, but uh, this is not meant to be a, uh, this is not meant to be a development uh, session, so I'm not even going to go into the code uh, itself. Now, the application, one of the things that was done over here is the application was written to take advantage of Docker. So I'm just gonna bring up, whoops, Oh, actually, I see what's happening. Okay, good. There we are. So I'm going to open up the application in Visual Studio Code. You could use whatever uh, development environment text editor you want over here. Um, but I do want to bring to your attention over here, there's something called a Docker file over here. I could spend more time on this, but unfortunately, we have limited time together. Uh, so I'm just going to uh, mention right now that this is a two-tier application. We've got a front end and a back end to that application. Um, and in that two-tier application, um, we have two containers that are necessary to do that. We're using a complementary technology over here called Docker Compose to bring up both uh, containers and run them. Let me show you that in action over here. I'm gonna use the, oh, I hope I, I don't know if I installed it. I'll install it if necessary, Docker Compose and bring up the application nope just install it quickly docker compose won't take long and uh, But what Docker Compose is going to do for us over here is uh, because the application is a two-tier application, there's two services, if you want to think of it this way, a database backend, which is Redis, and the front end, a, um, which is going to be a web, uh, web application written in Python. Because it's a end tier project, we'll need more than one service. Doesn't need that have to be a tiered project, but we'll need multiple service. We'll use Docker Compose in development to quickly and conveniently bring up and down the list of application, uh, the services that I need to run over here. Uh, and that brings me to actually another indirect advantage of containerization, something that is not often mentioned, but I find mightily useful at my end, where with containerization, um, or as a developer myself, it's not uncommon that I need to use all sorts of different tools. Like I need to use maybe a Postgres database for one project, MySQL for another one, SQL Server for yet another one, and I might need to bring in some Apache Kafka, maybe some Spark, some Hadoop, some whatever else, um, and installing them on my machine. If I were to install all of that on my machine, as I'm sure you can agree, it would add up very quickly. So what I do over here is if I need, for example, SQL Server, I'm going to bring it up in a container. It is, it's available out of the box in a container. All right, so I can bring it up just by running a command over here, Docker run, SQL Server, boom, I've got SQL Server up and running. I need Apache Kafka, Docker run, bring up Apache Kafka in a separate container on my machine. So this allows me to use services, all sorts of services running locally on my machine without having to download nor install those system. I don't have to pollute my system by installing all sorts of tools over here. So let me try that again. So I'll do a Docker Compose over here. Oops, I might have to do that under, oh, give me a break. Wanna make sure that, okay, might've been it, uh, good, okay. This is not my development machine, my main development machine. Um, so that's why I didn't think of testing that, but there we go. So what's happening over here is because that's the first time I run those 
uh, those two containers. Again, I've got a front end and a back end over here. Those containers are not built in a vacuum. They actually do depend on other uh, container images. We've talked about things like file system, which would be part of those images. So what Docker is doing right now is it's downloading those dependencies, file system if you want, that we're going to build the application on. It shouldn't take too, too long. It's a one-time deal. After it's done, this is going to be saved locally. Uh, they're read-only, so, um, uh, so they'll be reused every time I run the same or different application that require those images. Give it a moment or two to complete. Click as it can. Come on. There we go. All right. So now the uh, we're configuring the container. This was done in the Docker file. Again, I wish I could spend more time on this, but I'll keep it superficial for now. And uh, pulling, there you go. That would be the second container over here. Pulling from image library and uh, creating the images, creating the container images. So these are the images that I can bring um, and run. Um, in any environment. And now that this is done, let's try it. All right, I'm going to bring up a browser window over here, try to connect to local hosts on port uh, 8080, if I remember correctly. And here's the application. It's a simple application. It's a voting application. Do you prefer cats or a dog? Uh, you can reset the application. This uh, is the application running in the container. And I can show you that it is indeed in the container. Uh, let me do a Docker PS process. I need to run that as sudo. Uh, and it's going to show me you've got two containers that are running over here the Azure Vote front and the Azure Vote back over here. They're both running right now. Um, and something else I can do is I can shut down. Let me shut down both of those. I'll use a Docker Compose down, bring those down, refresh. And spin, spin, eventually it's going to fail saying, hey, I can't connect. There you go. This site is inaccessible. So you've seen over here that I am, this application was indeed running in a container. So as a programmer, as I'm writing the code for my application, there is the Python code over here for the application. I write it. And when I run it, I run it in a container. So that's going to be the same environment in which my um uh, in which we're going to run it in prod. I don't even need to install Python on my local machine. Actually, I don't even know if I have Python on this machine. Actually, I do, but it's Python 2. Do I have Python 3? Yes, I do, but 3.6.8, I'm not sure which version uh, it was running under, but I don't even need to have Python installed on my local machine to write the code to run this application. Python is in the container. Or another way to express that is that even though I do have Python 3 installed over here, when I run the application in Docker, I'm not running it through Docker. I'm running, I'm not running it from my machine. I'm running it from the image itself. All right, so I want to deploy that to Azure now. I want to deploy that to the cloud. So let's get started with that. I'm going to accelerate things a little bit. The next thing I'll need to do over here is I'll need to um, create a container registry, someplace where I can push my container in the cloud. And Azure has that for me. I'm going to first create a resource group. I'll do that from the command prompt over here. Create, uh, create, and let's call it, uh, let's call it, uh, now what's the name of the application? Vote app. That'll be my resource group. And I'll move that to location. Let's go Canada Central. Shouldn't take too, too long to create. Boom, it's done, all right? Now that the resource group has been created in Azure, this has nothing to do with Docker. If you're not familiar with resource group in Azure, they're application lifecycle boundaries. So normally you would have one resource group per microservice. All right, so next let's create an ACR, an Azure Container 
registry. Now, container registry, Docker container registry, to be more precise, is a standard service and protocol that we use over here to push and pull, as well as version containers in Docker. So let me create over here an ACR, Azure Container Registry. I'll put it in the resource group that I just created over here, Vault App. Uh, let's give it a name. Uh, let's call it, uh, blah, 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 blah. Um, there we go, Vault App Service. I say I'll give it for now. Uh, and to save on my developer credit over here, I'll use the SKU basic. Now, it shouldn't take too, too long to create. While this is creating, I can go over here. There's my Azure. I'll go to my resource groups. We should see there go. Here's the vote app. I'll make that a little bit bigger for us. There's the vote app resource group. And in here, there's no resources to display, but eventually we'll see the, um, the ACR being created. Now it's going to take a moment or two and I also need to log into the ACR. I'll show you how to do that in a moment. There you go. It has been created. So if I do a refresh, a refresh, uh, no resources to display. Sometimes it takes a while for the uh, UI I find to refresh itself. So I'm not going to wait for that to complete. Instead, let me log in to my ACR from the command prompt so that I can then push containers over here. So I'm gonna log in to the ACR that I created over here and the name was, uh, what was it? Boat App Service. And uh, log in, expose token. Uh, sorry, it's not what I expected to see. Oh, okay, let me just do that for a second. And uh, what am I missing? Is it in CR login? Oh, I think I see what's happening over here. Hmm. That might make a presentation a little bit short over here. Um, based on the air, let me try one more thing. Case is because I'm not logged in as super user. I'll need to log in quickly. I'll do that in a separate window. And uh, boom, we're good. All right, and I'm just gonna try that again. Uh, serving credentials. Can I launch the bus without X11? Oh, that's going to be irksome. And I do apologize. This is not my uh, development machine over here. I uh, did some uh, preliminary tests over here, but uh, I did not do my ACR login. Hmm. Let's try it without. All right. Uh, I'm going to move ahead over here. And uh, what I'll do just to move ahead, I know it's getting close to the end of lunch over here. Let me see if I can push it to my ACR. Uh, I'll first need to tag, uh, tag my services over here, which was actually, take a look at our, uh, my list of images uh, list. So do that. So I've got a couple of images over here. The important one is Azure Vault front over here. Let me tag it so I can push it to my ACR. So that's the name of the image that I have over here, Azure Vault Front. And I'm going to tag it with my container that I've created just a moment ago. Actually, sorry, there's something I should show you before. Uh, let me list my ACR because I'll need to have the what we call the server name. Uh, and that's uh, boat app service. And uh, 
ACR, not ARC. And the app service could not be found. Yes, because that's not the name of the resource group. All right. So here's my vote app service application over here. What I needed out of this is the name of the login server, which is fairly predictable. But now what I'll need to do over here is I'll need to tag, what we call tag, my local image with the remote server over here, Azure Vote Front, um, and also give it a version, let's call it version one. All right, so what I've done over here is I've simply told my local image, you actually belong to that container registry, which is called, it's a DNS name over here, Vote App Service .azure -cr .io. Let's um that's where you actually uh, exist now if i may do another docker image less than uh, i should see there I go here's my vote app service azure cro there's the tag image that i have over here there's the version i gave it just a moment ago over here um so let's try to push it over now this is the part that may or may not work let's see push and uh, Azure front version one. And uh, that has to do. And that's the part I was worried about. Um, and what I'm going to do at this point, I would love to show you the full gamut over here, but we are getting short on time over here, right? Um, the part that's happening over here, and I don't, um, unfortunately, time's not going to permit me to do that, is now that my ACR has been created, there it is, vote app service, I need to set up access to it. And I was hoping to use the easy approach over here to use access, not the approach that we would use in production. Um, in production, we'll want to use Azure Active Directory, AAD. But unfortunately, uh, in my demo, I'm not going to be able to use that over here. Not that it's complicated, not that's, that it's difficult, but it would require a little bit more work for me to do that. Um, and another thing as well I'm cognizant of is that it's getting dangerously close to one o'clock. I know some of you um, are going to be finishing your lunch very soon. So what I'm going to do over here is I'm just going to wind things down quickly for us. Um, if you're interested, we can continue discussing uh, other steps in bringing that forward. But um, to move ahead, let me go back a little bit to our presentations over here. All right, so um, I'll leave that as is. Now, for I know that I've only covered some of those elements superficially, right? Unfortunately, one hour is not enough for me to really do justice to microservices, Docker, Kubernetes, and peripheral elements over here. So for those of you who are interested, um, I've brought together a list of courses that do dwell in that level of detail and more importantly uh, they give you a chance to actually do what i was what i started demonstrating over here <coughs> so developing application especially for the programmers in the session today uh, if you're interested to knowing more what do i need to know to write application to microservices application containerization uh, application well there's the wa2675 which covers exactly that architecting microservices with Kubernetes, Docker, continuous integration. So it shows you how to bring all those pieces together uh, and the best practices. So it's not just the mechanics behind microservices development, Docker, but also best practices and also why and where does it provide value. Moving down for the systems administrator, if you want to know, what do I need to know? If, we're, if my organization is going to move to microservice architecture, what do I need to know as a system administrator? Well, for this one, I'm going to bring you to the Microsoft course uh, for that. If you're going to be operating those in Azure, the AZ-104, 
And finally, uh, if you are a programmer yourself and you want to know more about developing for Azure, including serverless, a container-based application, this is something that we cover in the AZ-204. So those uh, will be provided for you if anybody's interested. If you have any questions on those, let me know. But I did want to throw those your way. Hope you guys have a fantastic weekend. And again, stay safe, stay healthy, and hopefully we'll see you again soon in another seminar.